Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join today's webinar on Zero Trust for Developers, Why Site Reliability Engineering is Becoming Essential in Today's Security Operations Center. My name is Brendan Bouchard. I'm a multi-domain architect here at Cisco. Uh, with me today is Mac, who will be handling the Q&A. So if you have any questions that come up throughout the session, by all means, we want to make it as interactive, whether that's through the Slido or through the Q&A, we'll allocate some time there at the end. Um, and with that, let's jump into it. Um, so there are a lot of challenges facing organizations and they're having a lot of trouble keeping up with, you know, the threat landscape as it continues to evolve and gets faster and more effective um, and traditional operations just are struggling. So with that, we're going to take a look at and dig into the fundamentals of zero trust. We're going to pull it all together and show how site reliability engineering and DevOps principles applied to cybersecurity. Are, are really essential moving forward for, for organizations. You know, organizations have already invested a lot into their IT infrastructure and security, yet threats still continue to find their way through. When those threats do get through, it takes months, even years to detect them. Actually, in 2020, the average time to detect a breach was 206, 207 days as far as time to detect. That's an unreal amount of time for a threat actor to be in, you know, an organization systems causing chaos and, and running amok. Um, and security teams are, you know, strapped with disjointed tools, limited uh, you know, manpower capabilities with a lack of, of visibility, integration and collaboration that's critical for many organizations and without such can cause disastrous consequences. So let's take a look at what happens when we trust just a little too much. So we have our, our threat actor here and you know, how easy is it to, to send an email with you know, a phishing link or some sort of uh, malware payload that gets run and we all know that someone ultimately is gonna end up clicking that. That malware then, you know, whether that's they give up credentials and the user now has um, access as though they're a legitimate user or it's a malware that's propagating throughout, we'll start to you know, have that lateral movement and start to pivot in towards the data center, you know, harvesting passwords, um, deploying itself all over and running until it hits you know, the servers that it's looking for, at which point it will either exfiltrate data, it could encrypt the data, right? There's so many bad things that happen. Um, that attacks monetized, incentivizing more threat actors to go ahead and reproduce it. Um, this is a sequence that we see over and over and over again. And the reality is, is that there are a lot of challenges that need to be addressed. Um, and it really requires a shift in mindset. And it's, I'm of the opinion that the DevOps principles and, and SREs are really an essential element to pulling all of that together. I think you'll agree with me here as, as we go through. So let's unpack this a little bit, right? What went wrong with this situation? Was it you know, inadequate tooling, such as uh, email security, uh, lack of MFA? Potentially, right? It could, it could have been. Uh, was it a siloed organization where a lack of information sharing uh, makes an appropriately coordinated response really, really difficult? Yeah, that certainly isn't helping, right? Um, it could be because the tools don't work together and the team hasn't had enough time or training to maximize the capabilities of what's deployed. It's turned on, but it may not have every feature enabled. It may not be leveraged to the greatest extent possible, right? Each of those pieces plays a major factor and it's not any one necessarily. It's the culmination of so many of those challenges stacked on top of each other that start to create um, you know, significant issues for organizations. And with that, we're gonna jump into the first polling question. So if you have Slido, uh, it should be popping up in, in WebEx. Uh, if not, you can access it from your mobile device. But the first question, you know, at the high level, what, what cybersecurity threats are most concerning for your organization? Is it something like denial of service, uh, you know, phishing, supply chain attack, ransomware, or the large bucket of 
anything else, uh, let us know. And we look like we're starting to see some, some results coming through. Let's see. Overwhelmingly, we have uh, fishing as thus far at right about 40, bouncing around a little bit, 40 to 43%. Uh, for phishing, ransomware is at 29%. Denial of service is at about 20. Supply chains at about eight, and the bucket of others about three. So, yeah, you know, it's really telling, right? Phishing is is still email is still the number one attack vector because it's a streamlined process to get you know compromising payloads, whether that's through compromising credentials or whether that's through downloading you know files like it's a clear path to bypass all of your internal systems so it makes a lot of sense and is very consistent with the things that we're seeing similarly the destructive nature of of ransomware is um, definitely something that we see often so as everything settles out it looks like we're at about 42 percent for phishing 30 percent for ransomware uh, denial of service is about 20, supply chain is seven, and other is about 4%. So very, very interesting. We'll, we'll keep that in mind as, as we move through. So as we think, take a look at every organization, large or small, whether they're the smallest, you know, mom and pop shop to a Fortune 100 company, the building block of all of our operations come down to the people, the tools, and the processes. Um, now, it's obvious that not all of those organizations have the same budget, access to talent as one another, but they all have some limitations in those regards, right? Skilled people will always be in high demand and are essential to the success of a company. Similarly, without adequate tools in place, protection from advanced threats would be an impossible task. The process, however, is really the only thing that an organization can own. Products have licenses that expire and go end of life, Employees come and go, but the process that an organization adopts uh, belong to them as long as they continue to provide value. So when we really look at that paradigm shift, so much of the attention and focus on the traditional security practices rely heavily on tools and people when more often than not, it's that process that is what we should be leaning upon and leveraging the process to define what the actions the people are using the tools for and in the most effective way possible. Highlight that a little bit more. You know, let's talk about the challenge of uh, more often than not, we hear conversations where you know, we need, we're understaffed, we need more people. Um, I will argue till I'm blue in the face, today's threats are not a people problem to solve. Obviously, that's with a caveat of if you have no people, then there's an, another challenge there unto itself. But typically speaking, just adding additional people um, is not as cost prohibitive to effectively provide the coverage that's needed. But additionally, they we have you know, nights and weekends. We have the expectation of taking vacation, or uh, you know, people shift and change jobs. When you look at the model of every solution having at least one subject matter expert and then a backup in case that person decides they are taking a vacation or would like to you know, have a, a night or a weekend. Yet you're looking at two people, individuals at a bare minimum for every solution. Now, one or two solutions that makes a lot of sense. But when we see, you know, uh, environments where there's 15 or plus security tools, that model doesn't scale at all. And so what we end up seeing is a proliferation of tools that are deployed to the lowest common denominator as far as capabilities go. So you know, that's the firewall that is in the path, but maybe hasn't allow any any rule. So you're not doing anything with it, but it's still in line. So the, the box is checked from that standpoint. Um, so we start to see this, you know, the complexity going up with more systems, more people involved in the process and the capability starting to plateau or even going down with this false sense of security is leaders come in with the understanding of 
you know, what the, the capabilities are of these tools, not necessarily knowing that there's this ever growing security gap. Um, so the way that we look at and the way that we approach security challenges needs to shift significantly. Um, and in that shift, you know, we should really be looking at adopting site reliability engineering. And so this is where, you know, in order for the SOC to be as effective as possible, they need that skill set of, of the DevOps principles, SRE. Uh, we need to change the way we look at how our teams operate and site reliability engineering is a critical component to that. Providing a sense to see the forest from among the trees, to break down barriers, drive collaboration, and incremental efficiencies uh, all along the way. If, you, if the need for DevOps principles are applied by a SOC as a means to achieve zero trust uh, isn't already clear, sit tight. We're gonna dive into it here in just a minute. Before we do, we have one more Slido poll for, for the time being. Uh, poll question two, how many dedicated SREs or developers does your organization employ? All right, as it's settling out, we have, oh, it's, we just had a shift. So one to five is at 29%, zero and greater than 20 are at 25% a piece and six to 20 are at 19%. So it's from, as far as the audience goes, we have, I would say, a, a very wide spread of different, um, sort of capabilities from, from the standpoint of you know, security automation. So we'll let this settle out for, for just a little bit more. Uh, let's see, as of right now, we have 62 votes in. So zero and one, one to five are tied at 29%. Greater than 20 is at 24 and six to 20 is at 18. So all in all, pretty even distribution there. So it's really interesting, thank you. As we dig into it, let's, you know, talking about, I uh, spent a fair amount of time describing the, the problem, right? The challenge that we face um, and touching quickly on to DevOps and site reliability engineering being a potential solution to, to that challenge. Um, now we've covered the challenges facing organizations at Lake. As we get into the specifics of what the SRE can provide, we really need to take a step back and make sure that we're clearly clear on the definition of zero trust. So fundamentally, zero trust principles are that we never assume trust, always verify, and enforce least privileged. Now, despite, you know, what I, the takeaway that I want everyone to have here is zero trust is a mindset rather than being a product or tool. Despite what any vendors, you know, including Cisco at times might say, um, zero trust is an approach, it's a mindset, and it's a high level thought process by which to um, move forward with your, with your operations. So if this, the three bullet points here don't immediately clear things up, Let's take it one step further to the basics of cybersecurity. We have the CIA triad. So this is the cornerstone of cybersecurity, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In essence, the resources need to be accessible. Only those who should view it can see it um, and that nothing's been modified by unauthorized parties, right? So, Six bullet points compromising the fundamentals of cybersecurity and zero trust. They're all pretty abstract and broad. Let's take it a little closer to home. The concept of zero trust, you know, taking it from that broad definition, we need to be able to start to bring some reality back into it and break things down into consumable pieces. So the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, has several great documents regarding zero trust that will be included in this, in this deck as it goes out. 
The pillars of zero trust, according to CISA, are identity, device, network environment, application workload, and data. All of those built on the foundation of governance, visibility and analytics, automation and orchestration. But all these pillars, as we say, don't work in silos, right? No, they are, of course not. Their capabilities rely heavily on one another and close integration in order to operate effectively. As we move from the high level mindset to specific technologies, the need for tight integration becomes more apparent. As you've noticed, the automation orchestration side of this is interacting with every other pillar, which in turn provide telemetry to the analytics and visibility capability, which in turn drives more effective automation. It's this continuum of leveraging efficiencies to provide additional data to streamline those efficiencies further and be able to move you know, more effectively, faster, smoother um, with being able to do more with less better. That shift in dynamics from process being a manual effort to the manual effort defining the automated process is critical. So as we take that into from the pillars of zero trust to translating that into what we need to do to leverage zero trust within our organization, uh, we need to really perform these four functions. First, we need a means of active, accurately establishing trust to verify user devices uh, and increase visibility. Second, we need a way to enforce the trust. So if we have a user that has, you know, we need controls in place to say, if this user does not have trust, we can apply a block and prevent them from accessing that resource. Beyond that, we need to continuously verify. So we need to be evaluating to make sure that just because they were trusted a week ago, a day ago, five minutes ago, if their behavior changes and they start acting, you know, it starts walking and dark, quacking like a duck, then being able to treat it accordingly. Um, so that's that continue to verify and then the ability to respond to changes in trust. So that all of those dynamic mechanisms, if it isn't abundantly clear that where the automation and development fits within that, that should be the piece right there. The manual effort of going through these cycles continuously and having um, someone in there at the keyboard going through that for every user is not a task or, or a job that I think any of us would, would particularly want. And if you do, I apologize for um, saying anything negative about your job, but I would, I would question it, right? So what does that look like? Well, given, given some fun graphics, um, we have, you know, we assume that everything is bad until proven otherwise. And then through mechanisms, that's the tools themselves, integration, cross-referencing, and a little bit of you know, SRE magic, we're able to then funnel that through and say, you know, this device, user, data, and network is encrypted. It's a clean PDF. Uh, we know the user is Bob from, from IT, and they're on a compliant BYOD iPad. So we may not give Bob full access, they're going to get restricted access in this particular case because they're on a BYOD device, but they're still going to, they're going to have a certain level of access. So being able to have that understanding of maybe there's a different experience based on the context of any one of those things, that it doesn't necessarily have to be all block or all access, um, being able to manage and manipulate that experience as it goes through. And we all know that there's no such thing as magic, right? So really it's the DevOps there, not even necessarily that we're doing application development for this, from the standpoint of commercial applications, but even internally, it's that continually evolving practice of understanding what's in the environment, what the policies are, running through and validating that the operations are working, monitoring, uh, using that data to further 
enhance and mature your organization's overall posture. So buying back time to you know, become more effective to ultimately have that feed into and continually um, build upon that. And CIS has done a very good job of helping define, you know, what does that maturity look like? So in every one of those pillars, there is a breakdown of you know, traditional, advanced, and optimal so that you can see, you know, how you stack up and a comparable against where your organization sits. And as you start to look at the maturity, the things that start to pop out are, you know, continuous validation, real-time analytics, dynamic policy, strong integration, con constant device monitoring, learning-based threat protection, right? All of those pieces are fundamental to SRE, to DevOps principles. That's not something that is going to be a, a manual effort to achieve, right? And as you look at it from that maturity model, all of the basis at each level, the, categor the categorization that defines the next level is more integration, more analytics, more visibility, uh, and more orchestration. So as all of those things continue to build on one another is how we're defining maturity. So the last uh, poll question that we have for, for today's session is, you know, at a high level, obviously the, the devil can be in the details. How would you rate your organization's cyber maturity according to the CISA model? And I'll leave this open for just a second and then I'll jump back so that we have the last slide. So as you're making your, going through your polling, uh, you can use that as a comparison. We have advanced at 47%, 48, uh, traditional at 39%, and optimal at 14%. So it's really interesting. And I'd say, especially given the distribution that we saw of the number of dedicated security SREs for an organization, it's really interesting to see kind of that breakdown as far as the the maturity goes so we hear these concepts all the time right from the shift left to um, infrastructure as code to getting closer you know as applications become more and more of the serverless micro services you know kubernetes based the interaction and the expertise of the traditional SOC analyst needs to change in their perspective, as well as the how we go about securing or thinking of the security for for all of our tools. So from obviously the foundation of secure development, um, you know, doing static code analysis, uh, making sure that your CI/CD pipelines are secure, the uh, your deployment runtimes, uh, being able to have the validation um, the analytics uh, above and beyond your operations that you have running, um, you know, pulling all of those things together from the development to runtime to operations, the whole life cycle, right? And being able to have all of those teams talking in, in close coordination with one another. And ultimately, we're looking at, you know, facilitating that complete visibility. So we want to know what everything is um, in the environment. We want to be able to see every conversation. We don't necessarily want to decrypt for, you know, legal reasons or regulatory challenges that there may or may not mean we need to see the specifics, but we need to see all the flows. We need to understand what normal looks like, what deviations from normal, and then be able to adapt ubiquitously, you know, across the board and appropriately for all of the different platforms. And obviously that is that proliferation of challenge from the remote user to multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, um, you know, the, that challenge is ever increasing. And so to do that, we need to leverage a effective platform and be able to build against a standard that has all of those applied. This is a little plugin that'll 
I'll have for for Cisco here, and then we'll jump into the demo. Um, but you know, all of those different tools needs don't operate in a vacuum, right? The those pillars aren't silos. They are. It's an interwoven architecture of capabilities that need to complement one another, be bound together by um, the ability to have you know dynamic threat intelligence, both internal and external sources to be able to cross-reference and verify um, and tie it all in for identifying from you know risk-based management all the way to incident response and how you go about triaging. So it, there's not any one facet that needs to be you know, highlighted uh, above and beyond. They all work together, right? They're, those capabilities all work hand in hand. And more and more that analytics and that intelligence is the driver for so much of the maturity moving forward and being able to effectively implement it just because we have it. Again, it comes back to that. We need to be able to enforce that policy. So it's those enforcement points being complemented by the analytics all tying together and operating cohesively as, as one entity. And to see this put into practice, I queued up a, a little bit of a demo. So for this, we'll walk through, we'll start with the outcome and walk it back a little bit, right? So in this case, I'll give you the scenario. It is a phishing email that was the culprit of this incident, um, but that's typically not what we see, right? It's not necessarily, unless the, our email security is blocked that it's the the symptom will be something else. It'll be a file event. In this case, it is a user that reaches out to a malicious domain unsuspectingly. So let's walk through this setup here as far as the, the process goes. So in this, we're integrating with our real-time collaboration tools. And this is the little bit of you know SRE magic that is sprinkled on for the process of we don't want our team to just have automated blocks across the board. We want to be able to see and understand the details of what's taking place and give them the flexibility to be able to manage it. So in this case, you know, we can see that there's a user that was reaching out to domain. We can see the endpoint details that we grabbed from that. The back end, all of this investigation was kicked off. So we can see the you know, traffic that it's seen from here. We have our web security appliance. Uh, this one just sees an IP, but we see these similarities as far as the IP addresses that they're reaching out to overlaid with that threat intelligence. So, and then we can also see a couple of users that were interacting with this as well. Um, so being able to pull in, and that's the process is defined by the organization, already taking that, running through that full investigation and grabbing a snapshot copy of it, creating an incident. So by the time this lands on the desk of the analyst who may not have anything to do with the automation on the back end, they just know that they have their process to run through, they're able to immediately take action. So from here, they can kick it off and immediately block those observables, um, leveraging additional automation for those, each specific to the different types of um, observables there. In this case, these IP addresses were both flagged as malicious. We'll just go ahead and block them. This is all done, again, from a collaboration tool. So this could be, you're not tied to your desk at this point in time. You could be at the beach. You could, you could be at dinner with spending time with friends and family. Um, you know, as things pop up, be able to run through and take that action. Additionally, for those particular devices, we have the ability to go through and see. So in this case, those IPs were blocked. And when we run that block, it's using APIs to push out those to every tool that we have in the environment. We also have specific operations that are available. Um, these are using uh, Cisco's SecureX uh, orchestration platform as the, the back end for managing these workflows. We have workflows that are available to be run for each of these different objects. So for these IP addresses, we can run different um, actions. For the emails, we can run it's quarantine. 
all of these are, you know, this is obviously a demo environment, but all of these actions are what are defined for the applicable tools and operations for your organization. So, you know, we just contained that incident from that card in a couple of minutes, we ran through. And if we need to dig into the specific details of what that investigation dug up, maybe we you know, don't want to just drop the hammer on everything so quickly. Uh, we can go through and take a look at what was pulled as part of that investigation to get the details. So there's the specific systems that are involved. This is leveraging Cisco's uh, SecureX threat response, but we can see the domain that was malicious that was reached out to have the ability to take action, you know, whether that's blocking the domain uh, or leveraging the power of that, those native integrations built in there, um, be able to pivot through and you know, address whatever concerns or issues come up. Um, this has then the sightings and all of those details as well. Uh, so all that tied in and highlighting the ability to take it from the automated action, whether that's the triage perspective and going through all the way to the point at which we are you know, able to be into the log files themselves, looking at the sighting events um, and that sort of traditional manual process, being able to blend the two and just be as effective as possible. And with that, I know we were, we were screaming through um, questions. Mac, do do we have any questions queued up? I think we have a we have a couple that we can go through, Brennan. Um, and if, if to the audience, if you if you have any more questions, feel free to plop those in the Q and A. And if we have time, we'll we'll try to hit that live. Um, here, I'll give you this one, Brennan. I think this is a I think this is a good one, right? Um, our DevOps team has tried to work closer with the security operations team, right? The SecOps team. Uh, but with limited success, do you have any suggestions for getting them interested? Right, and, and I'll say we actually see the probably the the reverse sometimes too, right? Where uh, the SecOps team wants to work more with the DevOps team, right? They they couldn't necessarily build a lot of the things that you just showed, right? But they could definitely use some help doing it. So I guess in both directions, right? How do you how do you maybe better enable the teams to start working together more closely? Absolutely. So in uh, previous roles is definitely wearing that hat as the the SRE and you kind of become the grand negotiator, if you will, uh, between teams, because so often you are that facilitator of there's different tools and there are individuals who may be the, the subject matter expert. What personally what I found to be very successful there is, you know, kind of playing off of that. We there's something in it for everybody and whether that's something we at a previous um, project that we had at one point in time was we were trying to get vulnerability data and make sure that we had certain um, patching criteria and asset information from um, you know VMs when they were spun up. And so part of that was helping the uh, infrastructure team. They had a couple of needs that they would like to see as part of that process anyway. And so it was kind of a, a matter of like, helping them address their challenges because they're going to be focused on, you know, we all have our scope of what it is that we care as far as care about to go. Um, and so just identifying where those are for those particular teams, kind of sitting in their shoes a little bit and helping make sure that you're not creating, they see the effort that you're doing is complementing and making that easier for them to do their job uh, rather than you're going to create more work for, for them is been successful in, in, um, for me at this point. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more, Brennan. Right. And I think, you know, if, if there is, you know, a hierarchical structure, if you will, to, to those teams, right. Where there's a uh, leadership that, that manages teams from both sides, having tight integration at that leadership level, uh, and being aligned on priorities, what's working, what's not, you know, helps kind of continue that infinity racetrack, right. And make sure that, um, again, the, the two teams can kind of come together, right. To, to solve common goals, right. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, totally. Let's do, let's do one more. Um, from your perspective, uh, what are common challenges you've seen with organizations just looking to bring in an SRE, right? That, that maybe they don't have them today. They they obviously see the need, right? Um, can you, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I would say, I think it's an interesting 
you know, you see whether it's on LinkedIn, or you see these job postings sometimes, and they're like, oh, you know, experience required, and they want you to be a front end, a back end developer, a, a database engineer, have an understanding of, you know, and it's like, they want a IT and security organization. And so I think stepping back from that a little bit, obviously the technical skills and, and um, aptitude are incredibly important. I think the best SREs that I've worked with uh, have that ability. It's that communication and technical balance. It's being able to translate the bits and bytes into you know, how that affects processes and how that's beneficial both from uh, organization, you know, manpower wise, but also to the bottom line. It's, you know, we're all working in the organizational priorities vary at, you know, differing degrees depending on what your organization is, but there are, you'll always have those. And so just making sure that those, you know, are in alignment and that they have that collaborative nature to them. It's, I would say the mindset in that is so much more important than any of the the technical skills you have the 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 world's knowledge at your fingertips so finding the information is is i'd say a lot less critical anymore than someone who has the aptitude and, and the desire absolutely couldn't, couldn't agree more brennan one more here and i think this is a good one right this this will be some some There'll be some broad strokes here, right? Um, but interesting to, to see what your thoughts are here. Uh, we have a participant that's that's going to start a new job as an SRE. What are the main topics or things that, that they can do to prepare them uh, to get ready for that SRE role, right? So maybe a, a, a background in, in other things, uh, you know, DevOps or ap application development, right? But not necessarily sort of this, this SRE type role. Um, any advice? Yeah, um, just as much learning as possible. I would say, you know, every one of the cloud providers has some mechanism of a free, whether that's a free year of like free tier or, you know, get your hands dirty. So from the technical side, get your hands dirty, play around, break stuff, you know, de deconstruct things, put it back together, figure out how, how they work. Like nothing is going to be more effective than running through that. I, mean, I, I personally do really well just reading books and kind of translating that in my own personal sort of uh, development. On the other end of that, I would say the be open-minded and come in to an organization with more questions than answers. You know, I would recommend as if you're starting a new job, like the first portion just be uh, almost this data gathering. Sit down with as many people as will talk to you and say, what do you do? What works? What doesn't? Where Where do you see? And not necessarily that you're immediately jumping in with the solution to fix everything, but getting an understanding and getting, uh, you know, there are going to be a lot of common similarities for organizations, but there are always going to be those unique sort of um, issues and things that come up. So being able to have as comprehensive of a here's what you know is the lay of the land looks like will equip you with the ability to start making those incremental change you know change for for organizations for people is challenging it's always going to be slower than than you'd like it to be um, it gets people uncomfortable and so finding those places and starting to build those relationships before coming in and just kind of uh, being seen sometimes as like yanking the rug out is, is really important. So that would be uh, two pieces is go break stuff uh, in a development environment um, and come in just, you know, asking as many questions as possible. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Brendan, right? I think the more you know about the organization that you're about to join, what challenges they, they face, right? Where maybe some of their inefficiencies are. Like that's the baseline knowledge that you need to acquire first before making any recommendations or trying to make an impact, right? Because you want to make sure that the effort that you do put forth and the skills that you do have, you know, you want to make sure that those uh, are applied, you know, in the most meaningful way as possible, right? In that SRE role. So getting that baseline um, is certainly important. I guess last totally. question, last question, right. this should be a pretty quick one. Um, the question is, how many SREs would you require per employee? But I'll, I'll kind of take a step back and say, how do we know how many SREs 
we should need, right? And how do we know when to, to scale that team out? Um, how do we know if we need any at all, right? I guess, how to size that team. Personal sort of math there, you know, not all FTE are created equal, right? The So I would say the the challenge there to put a hard, fast number on is there are some individuals who are incredibly capable and can produce, especially through development, it really lowers that common denominator as far as there's 24 hours in a day. Um, if they have the ability to build tools that you can start to create this force multiplier. So it depends on your people. Um, and if you could quickly have too many cooks in the kitchen, if there's too many things. So it's finding that balance of effectiveness. I would say almost that alignment of if you find yourself in constant meetings, but not getting anything done, there's a good chance that there's too many people trying to contribute ideas and finding ways to, to you know, identify whether, I don't know, you know, finding those, uh, that balance of being able to you know, accomplish tasks and still be making progress at a you know, exponential growth rate versus seeing things starting to plateau. Great, thanks for that, Brennan. I don't see any more questions, um, so I believe we can pass it back to Christy if, if you don't have anything else, Brendan. No, that's that's all I have. Thank you, everyone, so much for the time, um, and you know, look forward to to doing some more of these.